Today, a first-hand view from Ireland. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. But today I have Eddie Hobbs with me from Ireland. Hello, Eddie. Good morning. Good, well, good morning here. Yeah, good, good evening here. Yes, it's a funny time difference, but thank you very much for spending some time with me. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with you because you have been through the ringer with regard to the financial crisis in Ireland. And it rather feels as though what we're facing here in Australia now is somewhat similar to what you faced a decade plus ago. So I think we can learn a lot and perhaps also get a bit of a sense of what it's like the other side of the, the spin cycle, as it were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but let, let's start with just to introduce yourself, if you would, because I know you've got a, a firm over there and you also, I believe, have written some uh, material on the crisis as well. So just introduce yourself, if you would, please. Yeah, well, I'm a financial writer and advisor. And um, in 2005, I uh, wrote and presented a, a program on RTE State Television called Rip Off Republic which was a precursor to the crash which happened a few years later and uh, really the central theme of that is it kind of broke um, audience records here I suppose because of its content and uh, it was really explaining why uh, Ireland was eating its young, how uh, the property bubble was uh, creating a highly stressed um, environment for everybody, why prices were out of control and not just talking about property prices but right across a service-led economy, built on the wealth effect of rising prices. I'm sure all this is resonating. And um, and then, um, you know, what happened then happened later. I don't think, however, that even those that were on the, uh, shall we say, regard as the mavericks at the time, uh, would have perceived the degree of wiring underneath the global economy and the transmission that that created uh, from America's subprime burst right through to you know, popping all of the vulnerable parts of the global asset price bubble as it was at the time. Of course, hindsight is a great teacher, um, but at the time there was there were there, there was very little material on that under under uh, you know underground wiring, let's call it that. So, I have to be truthful, Martin. I've been watching aghast from afar on the events now uh, occurring in the Australian market and the similarities between it and what happened here are quite uh, quite remarkable in my opinion. Mm. Well, we've actually been following um, a, a little bit, th you know, through through the Irish cycle. In fact, I've been resurrecting some of the uh, TV interviews that were done a decade ago in Ireland. Right. And, you know, comparing and contrasting what the regulators said then with what the regulators are saying now, which is everything's fine. You know, the cap yeah. banks are strongly capitalised, um, and you've got the mainstream view that says, well, there's a minor correction going on, but there's nothing really serious, and it'll all sort itself out very quickly, and people should go yeah. on buying. You know, and, and it's like, um, well, it seems to me there's a huge amount of resonances. Um, so tell me this. You know, prior to the, the the crash hitting and i recognize that there was an international element to it but but you were there some you know really were there warning signs or was it really just uh, you know most people were just happy with the way things were going and just a very few people were saying we think we've got issues well it was very clear warning signs but the problem uh, i mean for example in 2006 um on a television program i was introducing the public uh, to the minsky bubble and pointing out that we were, you know, we were on the penultimate step of it when you look at the, you know, the behaviour around what was happening. And the reason for it was that uh, at that stage, the Irish economy, about 25% of it had be was reliant on the construction and property sector. All of the local councils had their nose in the trough. They were getting very high levies from, uh, from development, uh, which was jacking up local wages. Um, every uh, accountant, solicitor, uh, mortgage broker in the country uh, had geared up to their gills on property. Uh, the government revenues were bursting at the seams from these, this bonanza from the property sector. Um, academia, which is being paid for by the government through the university system, was bristling with people happy to come out and defend the establishment um, uh, from any suggested criticism that this thing was weak. We did have one uh, academic uh, who's really uh, an economist with a background in, in economic history rather than current economics, uh, Morgan Kelly, uh, 
who was quite blunt and said, this baby is going to blow and it's going to take the banks with it. And he was rounded it on uh, by the, uh, let's call it the establishment. Uh, and, and so it went on. And there were a number of voices, but um, it was a bit like, um, and I described it at the time, it was a bit like standing uh, in front of a watering hole with a with a herd of uh, of thirsty buffalo coming at you and a sign up saying water poisoned. It just wasn't going to happen. We also had in 2007, we had a very successful uh, national ECG stress test of our banks by the doctor, the IMF, uh, who said that we were in great shape and uh, that we had great cushions to absorb any shocks. But I mean, if you look behind the numbers, the, 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 the amount of credit that the Irish banks had absorbed in four years from 2003, 2007, went up six and a quarter times from 16 billion to 100 billion. And to put that into perspective, that was about 60 percent of Irish GDP. So we were really sitting out there and uh, but we were being told by those in the know that um, that everything would be fine. And even when the balloon was going off and it went off really from the Lehman collapse right through to our bailout two years later in 2010, we had the governor of the Irish Central Bank um, uh, going on radio uh, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers telling us even at that stage that, um, you know, that the best central banking brains in the world were, were working hard to solve the problem, at which point I left my office screaming. <laughs> well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, there is a certain complacency among those in, particularly in regulatory environments and uh, those perhaps in government too, saying it can never happen, everything's fine. And, and to, to an extent, what they're trying to do, I suppose, is court pour oil on boiling waters to try and actually stop this thing getting worse, right? But mm. frankly, words are cheap and, uh, you know, it doesn't really have a huge impact it seems to me in terms of what you know once the momentum is swinging the, that way almost mm. nothing can stop it well i agree i mean uh, you know once you go past the point of no return uh, and you you won't know it until maybe a few years later that that was the point of no return really these things play out and this time is no different uh, you know uh, the, the, the the establishment will say this time you know we are different this time it's different it doesn't really stack up to to any kind of analysis so when you look at the uh, what happened here, uh, you would have seen um, uh, at the time um, uh, it, it really a rounding on any voices of concern. And then when it happened, um, when when property prices began to, as they are now happening in Sydney and Melbourne, where you're beginning to see the what I call the um, the illusion of the soft landing uh, hypothesis now is is being spread. <laughs> And yep. being absorbed by everybody, really, that's cover for the old Turks to tiptoe quietly out of the market, get their loot out before the burst comes. And and that, that's a quite a cynical story. It's also being spread by people that want to believe it, you know, mm. and I can understand that because they're so exposed. But really, you know, it happened here. We were told that property prices would adjust. Five percent would probably be the, the bottom of the soft landing. And then we would take off again. Uh, this has happened in stock markets, as you know, if you look at stock market behavior, etc. in the past. And of course, once 5% was passed, then it became 10%. But, you know, don't worry. And then once you start going into double digits, and if you start approaching anywhere near 20%, in my opinion, what happens is that banks begin to panic. Uh, panic begins to set in. Uh, credit is tightened even further. Uh, and, and away you go. But the most important dynamic I've, we've experienced over here is the self-fulfilling dynamic, the deflationary dynamic that the buyer, the consumer, is simply saying, well, honey, if we hold off, uh, and don't bid now, we can buy the same property at a cheaper price in six months or 12 months time, or we can get, um, you know, we can get an even bigger property for the same price uh, in a better location in six or 12 months time. And then you get a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's never been adequately measured, in my opinion. You know, the, the effect of these, the self-fulfilling downward price spiral that the buyers themselves um, create. And that mm -hmm. shift in power from seller to buyer uh, really is is when the point of no return happens because it's very very difficult to shift that until such time as you hit rock bottom and when everybody comes to realize this is rock bottom prices are property is now selling at below its construction cost um, and then you're at rock bottom and you bop along the bottom there for whatever time it takes while banks are being repaired potentially nationalized 
before you before the next cycle commences. Meanwhile, mm. the central banks throughout the world will say, don't worry, you know, we got this, we understand what to do. All we have to do is manipulate the interest rate cycle and everything will be fine, not realizing, in my opinion, that they're part of the of the problem. Sure. Well, I think we can all say that uh, the quantitative easing that was done around the world has not been solved anything. In fact, you know, we just kicked the can on a bit, but in fact, in the process, inflating assets even more and just created a bigger, a bigger problem later. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, at the time when we started in Ireland to see the home prices begin to slide. What were the bank economists saying? Um, the, the reason for my question is that we've got a lot of bank economists here in Australia who are still saying, oh, look, very small, you know, 5% or 10% yeah. or something. But what they've done now every two or three months is basically make a slightly bigger call yeah. as to the fall and a bigger call and a bigger call. But they haven't really, you know said very much other than small incremental changes. Is that what happened over there as well? Yeah, well, there's, there's an iron rule, no matter what country you're in anywhere in the world, where uh, you just go to who's, who's paying the piper when, when, when you look at these things and what is the, you know, whether people realize it or not, there's a massive internal bias. If, the, if, the, if, your, if your kid's education and your mortgage payments are dependent on you thinking along a certain line, well, somehow you manage to think along those lines and you'll hold that until the evidence uh, is 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 just uh, uh, you know overwhelming, and uh, it's not just in economics; it's in politics. I think you will see it with the Republicans backing Trump, as they did with Nixon, and so on. That that people really, um, you know, when their when their entire uh, business or lifestyle is dependent on taking a particular line, they'll hold it, and it, you know, and they will they will just reject the truth. And yes, uh, to answer your question, every single economist from every single financial institution in Ireland, without exception, was telling us that everything is fine. We had a, we had a leading uh, professor uh, in one of our leading universities at the time, still quoting, still teaching children finance, saying everything is fine. Um, in, pa in point of fact, what we should be doing is we should be encouraging subprime mortgages now at this stage. Remember at this point in our cycle, people were up to 40 year mortgages. Uh, people were borrowing at 90 to 95 percent of the value of the property. If that sounds familiar, there was a you know more and more interest-only mortgages were coming in. When I look at the level of interest rate, interest-only mortgages in, in in Australia, I mean it it does look a little bit like Krakatoa. Uh, I can't comment on the underlying uh, uh, capital cushions of the Australian banks. I can only simply say that well, we passed all the stress tests that the IMF threw at us in 2007 over mm -hmm. here, and all of the central bankers. All of the economists, with very few exceptions, uh, were saying everything is fine, nothing to see here. And and these were the people that were uh, tasked, uh, uh, you know, and paid to act as the experts. You can understand politicians, you know, saying, you know, standing up to the podium to say whatever, whatever sounds, you know, populist. But um, but it was a complete failure of the economic profession to see it in Ireland, with some exceptions, notable exceptions. Um, but really not enough to penetrate the noise. And of course, over here as well, we also have a situation where the state broadcaster is a very dominant player in Irish media. They set the media agenda really every morning uh, in the national radio program, uh, Morning Ireland. So this is just a, just the name of, you know, what goes out in, between 7 and 9 a.m. in the morning. And, and really, you know, from around 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock early in the morning in the concrete bunker in, in Montrose, where RTE is based, a small group of people decide really what are the key issues for the news agenda that day, and it's picked up elsewhere. So when you, when, when you added it together, what you saw was that the, the actual organs of the state itself uh, were not focused on what could happen. Um, adequately, and uh, and and any and those that were giving the warnings were dismissed as mavericks, uh, and uh, you know, um, th th you know that that they they were stopped clocks. At at some stage, they'll get it right, but but not now. <laughs> okay, that, so let's just. Familiar? Uh, look, I, I've been hit over the head by four, you know, by pieces of 4x2 for the last three or four years because I've been saying for some time, 
all of the data and I, you know I'm lucky because I've got primary data from households as well as the publicly available data and I've been watching all of these uh, things fall into place and uh, you know every time I, I see another piece of evidence it looks exactly like other crashes around the world and yet still 98% of the economists and uh, all the media and all of the mainstream media in particular are all saying no no issues here everything's fine and in fact you know I'm just called a, a gloom mon monger and yeah. a, a well, property bear and etc cetera, etc cetera. but well I was I was fascinated by the the work that, that you did um, with a colleague I think mr. Adams if I've got the name right yes uh, on, Adams, yeah. on, on on area code 2570 28 yeah. miles southwest of Sydney and, yep. and the reason why that resonated so strongly with me that that's exactly uh, the origins of the television program Rip Off Republic in 2005, where, mm. uh, where, where, where really this stress point, for example, was an awful lot of young Irish parents in their early 30s and so on driving in uh, in, in endless traffic lines into Dublin uh, in the early hours of the morning with kids asleep in the back seat, uh, strapped in, uh, you know, toddlers on their way to be dropped off at creches, which were costing a fortune. Um, and really the lifestyle people were getting out of this so-called wealth effect and property boom had, 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 was beginning to generate a lot of misery um, because people were caught up, especially those that came in at the back end. So we had a great transfer of wealth that went really from the younger generation to the older generation and, and that has remained intact. So you have a huge wealth imbalance between maybe the over 50s and over 60s in Ireland and, and those in that age group. And we also had a massive destruction of uh, of middle class wealth in Ireland, so the uh, it, there wasn't a balance sheet really in Middle Ireland that wasn't devastated by the impact of the burst here because uh, every Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, had become a property expert. Uh, it was an upward only rising asset class as far as people were concerned. The stock market was for gamblers, and and you couldn't lose. So the level of debt that people had taken on was staggering. And they, they took the view, in hindsight, that just because the banks were giving them the credit, therefore they could sustain the credit. And of course, mm. that was the tragic mistake. We sure. also then we also then ended up, Martin, in a situation where um, we, we went into a burst with a, an insolvency model that really was unchanged since Dickensian times. It was relied, for example, on one particular piece of legislation that went back to the uh, medieval times, it's the Sheriff's Act. And we had no way of dealing with uh, with, a, with with a credit burst, and we really on, we, it was only by 2012 that the Irish government managed to bring in an insol a modern insolvency act, and even then, the insolvency act had been jimmied by the banks lobbying the Department of Finance in the background to ensure that the uh, that the that the insolvency model was poisoned uh, for the debtor, and that the the imbalance would continue to remain, and that's what happened. Uh, so you know, it was very, very unfair, but that's what was happening in the background before we, you know, there were some changes to our insolvency model recently. And neither at the time, which I would strong, strongly suggest should be looked at, it was there a joined up thinking between the, uh, between the Department of Health and the Department of Justice. The Department of Health tasked with looking after mental health services and the Department of Justice, which was tasked with bringing in an insolvency act. So uh, because the problem that the borrowers faced wasn't just a financial problem, uh, we had a very significant increase in suicide, uh, uh, very, very significant. A lot, of, uh, a lot of fine people took their lives um, rather than face the brutality of the Dickensian Irish legal system. So, and, and they were really victims of, of, um, of, of uh, carelessness by the state. Um, and, and then a failure to adequately respond, you know, when the balloon went up, because most of the first part of the crisis was spent uh, pointing the blame at other parts of society. So developers were hung out to dry, bankers were hung out to dry, uh, the financial regulator was changed uh, somewhat, and politicians then spent the next number of years arguing about how much they were to blame for what happened. Uh, meanwhile, the actual people who were suffering the most uh, which was the uh, young private sector worker uh, were losing their jobs and immigrating, a lot of them to Australia, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Yes, we've had a few conversations with people who came out from Ireland and it's like, we're seeing it all again, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty scary. Uh, one quick question, just in terms of, f for our viewers, the, the sort of, the quantum of home price falls from, from before to after, 
was what was the sort of quantum we would be typically looking at? Well, okay, well, you have to be careful of national averages. Uh, mm. Let me just deal with the um, the marginal part of the market first. This, these yep. would have been the, mo the most recent bills, all of those. Um, so we ended up with a very significant amount of ghost housing estates. In other words, mm -hmm. built housing estates with one or two residents or no residents in them. That, that became a very significant problem. The actual scale of house price falls from the sort of new suburban areas um, on the outskirts of Dublin in particular, and especially the sort of rural suburban areas, if you know what I mean, um, housing estates that were t uh, added on to towns and villages within, you know, 50 or 60 miles of, of, of urban centres. Really, the collapse in house prices there was anywhere between 60 and 80%. Right. Uh, and then if you go into the uh, if you go into the old quality, um, high quality property locations, the house price falls were about 50 percent. Uh, so really the range would I would say would be between a 50 and 70 percent range at, from peak to trough. And of yep. course, the, the you know the, reco the recovery has set in, but um, we're still well shy of the peak prices before 2008. Yeah, and, and I guess that's the key point, isn't it? Because this this was not um, something which was a deep fall and then a massive rebound. Essentially, it was a quite fast fall, but then a grind along the bottom for years and years and years. And even now, as you say, you know, things are not back to where they were. Mind you, they probably should never go back to where they were in terms of yeah. home prices. But in terms of the, you know, the numbers of households who are sort of still sitting on negative equity and are still struggling with debt, that's still a big issue, isn't it? It's a huge issue because of the problems we've had with our uh, insolvency model. It's, it's, yeah. we, it, there's only been a very recent change to it, which now allows bankruptcy um, to, to happen over a period of 12 months. I mean, we came into the burst with bankruptcy over 12 years, and then you were lucky if you were out the gap. So, I mean, it, it's been a huge change. But even at that, uh, the problem is that we, we, we still have a large number of people uh, constantly under pressure from Irish banks and their lawyers and the new companies that have come in and bought the loan books and their lawyers uh, 10 years after the burst. Mm -hmm. And it will go on for years to come. They're, they're, they're basically holding these assets in proxy for the, for the lender and they're subject to constant, um, constant pressure um, by, um, by, by lawyers, uh, unfortunately. And, and, and it's created huge problems so um so it's a real mess and um, we also have uh, on top of all of that because of the economic recovery we're now overlaying on top of that a huge problem with lack of housing supply um lack of uh, l large homeless problem um and 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 now young people have been priced out of the dublin in particular and um, they simply can't afford the rents whatever about the houses uh, in the greater dublin area so we're we're kind of back to square one um, and, and, and a lot of that has to do with lack of joined up thinking and also because over here we have, we have always failed ever since it was first attempted, there was a report back in the 70s here looking at and how do we control uh, land speculation, uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we kind of put some kind of a break on this from happening. Uh, and the problem is that Ireland, a lot of Irish wealth, a lot of powerful people in Ireland, the established people in Ireland, their wealth is based on property. A lot of mm. votes are based on property. And if you're going to deal with the problem, then you're going to have to put the brakes on rising property prices. And that doesn't suit a lot of people. Um, privately, they will, they, it, they, they will admit it doesn't suit them publicly. They'll say, of course, they're for change, but provided it's not in our area. Yeah. And on my balance sheet. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we see a lot of that here as well, because a lot of positions, people in positions of power have large property portfolios and, um, you know, they, they look at it through the lens of their own particular situation rather than perhaps the broader community interests, uh, which I always find very frustrating because, you know, obviously there are many people here hurting in Australia even now with... And remember that our interest rates are... are you know, our cash rate's 1.5% before the crash, Right. Um, so we don't have a huge amount of uh, ability to be able to take rates lower. Um, yeah. And we've also got uh, massively high debt. So the debt to income ratios are actually higher than they were in Ireland at the time that you had the crash there. So we, we are sitting on, 
on a pressure cooker here that is looking as though it's, li it's likely to blow quite soon. I guess one of the things that people often say, though, is Ireland is different from Australia in this regard, that effectively we can float our currency independently, right. whereas, of course, you were tied to the euro. Do, do you think there's some point there? You know, if you, well, if you had a... Yeah, I have a lot of sympathy with that. With that, uh, but it's but it but it but it's not. It doesn't outweigh the uh, the forces in the other direction. But but of course, I mean, if we had an ability to uh, devalue our currency, uh, we could have we could have softened the blow to the economy, um, mm. and maybe recovered a bit quicker. Um, but at the other side of that, because we were a member of the eurozone, we did have support of the European Central Bank and the EU Commission and the Troika. And despite all of the drama and problems. Uh, we, we we were in a position to get a line of credit. We were in a position to trade our way out of it. So we did have the benefit of the eurozone that way. The great problem we have, of course, is that, and it's quite clear that over the period, because of German reunification and because of the situation in continental Europe, the ECB base, the ECB interest rates were really out of kilter with what what was happening in the Irish economy. So we we the central bank wasn't in a position to control rising property prices in Ireland by raising interest rates, whereas you can do that, or at least well that that day is over now uh, for Australia. But but what 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 I what I thought was a, a deep concern. Really, when you saw the um, you know the Keynesian approach to you know money money expansion and the central banks you know dusting down uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, doctrine um, mm. and and using it on a global basis was that this was really going to create a huge problem for those economies that didn't uh, have the problems that all of the burst economies had uh, and they were going to ingest a huge misallocation of capital. Um, and that's what happened. I mean, from what I can see, Australia took in a lot. I think from China and other places, New Zealand, uh, Canada. So really, all of the all of those areas that had escaped the last problem were now ingesting the um, the misallocation of capital, which and they they could become the destination of the next problem. Um, so I don't. I mean, look, maybe there's a. I, I'm not expert enough to really comment in any great depth on whether or not uh, Australia uh, can get itself out of the jam that it's in. Uh, but I just don't see how it can. Mm. Um, I, and I don't, um, I don't believe in the hypothesis of the soft landing in these circumstances because it, it relies on uh, rational behaviour uh, from consumers, and consumers are not rational when mm. their wealth begins to destruct. Yep. No, I think you're right on that, and we certainly see again in our surveys a lot of people are saying, you know, they've now crossed the Rubicon, they want to get out, uh, or um, if they were thinking of buying, they'll wait till next year or the year after to. Buy, buy more later so that that tends to be a very important feedback loop um so i guess sort of 10 10 years after so you know the economy in ireland is still not recovered um people are still in significant difficulty um and to what extent have the policy makers changed their tune are they still basically still f you know going around the same circuit again or is there a new thread of thinking now Oh no, there is a new thread of thinking. Uh, the the Irish Central Bank, um, it was a child of the Irish Central Bank, the Irish Financial Services Regulatory Authority. It was in the same building. It was staffed by the same ex-central bankers. Were the regulator at the time? That's been pushed out of the way. The central bank is now the regulator. Uh, they're you know they're part of the ECB um, system. Uh, they have put in place a cap on the amount of uh, lending that that banks can do. So uh, that has put a cap subsequently on crazy prices. So prices have risen um, quite dramatically, nothing near the peak before the burst. But the availability of credit is much more restrictive. It's much more bureaucratic. The stress testing of borrowers is, has changed dramatically. Um, as a consequence of that, that has controlled rising property prices. But you can see the pressure, even from politicians now, again, coming around saying we must reduce this pressure on, on people getting into the market. The problem, of course, is the supply. This, we, just, we just don't have sufficient supply to deal mm. with the boom, which is back in Ireland. Uh, real wages are growing again for the first time um, uh, quite significantly. Um, the um, All of the anecdotal uh, evidence is there, uh, coffee shops, garage stations, petrol stations, teeming with people queuing up at lunchtime, buying their lunch rather than bringing a packed lunch. And uh, and, and this is, I mean, I use my local, uh, my local, we've, we've, there's quite a large petrol station close to my office. And I've always used it as a way of measuring kind of the early, early warning indicator was a very simple one. And it was only a few short years ago 
when people used to come in and fill up their car on five euros of petrol per fill, uh, and uh, which is remarkable, you know, mm. when you when you consider that. And the rear of this area, which would typically contain maybe fifty to a hundred, um, um, you know, uh, lorries, you know, with container lorries, uh, was was almost deserted. Maybe one, two, or three, and it's now jammed again. Um, the uh, the traffic going in and out of urban centres is up. All of the signs of an economy really strongly producing again is up. So this time around, I would think that uh, our biggest problem internally is housing supply and how to ramp that up fast enough. But really, our bigger our bigger problems are external. That we mm. would be very vulnerable to any external shocks in the global economy because we're such an open economy, and that's where. Uh, that's where we need to be careful. Uh, so all we can do, because we're so open, is try to develop better agility to deal with problems when they arise, because we can't control it when it does happen. I don't think um, I don't think because of the dampening effect of central bank rules, we'll be back into a housing burst anytime soon. But I I, I hope I don't live to regret saying that. <laughs> well, I think the externalities, and I, I watch those quite closely. You know, there are a whole bunch of risks around the world that I think potentially can come over the top and basically you know, upset any local economy, irrespective of the state of that local, local economy. Um, so as we sort of come to the end of the conversation, we, we've got a lot of people who follow us on, on, on our channel here who are, you know, property owners, mums and dads, people who actually are, in, you know, individuals in the property market. And, and my question to you was, knowing what you know and having been through what you've been through what would your advice be to those australians here who are potentially looking at price falls um mm. high levels of debt you know more risks more perspectives uh, of, of more difficulties ahead you know is, is there a particular sort of perspective that you can offer well i think um the, the, the non-financial message which which rarely gets talked about really is is simply well is people's mental welfare Mm. Um, that it's so important, I can't stress it enough, for families to look after the head of the family in particular and watch him or her very carefully uh, and, and go for early intervention as soon as there's any, any signs of excess stress coming on. Um, I think that outside of the financial side of it, that, um, that those that, that are in a position to look at it should very seriously prepare um, Australian and the Australian insolvency model to be able to deal fairly with people who are who get themselves into excess debt that they can't get out of, and that that is properly balanced between the interests of creditors and debtors, and that it's speedy, and that people understand that the faster these things are done, the speedier the resolution, the quicker the overall economy will come back. And don't make the mistake we did of kicking the can down the road and having an incremental uh, approach. Do what is necessary to be done quickly and dramatically, uh, rather than drag it out over over several years, which is just going to worsen it. Then you would say that um, you know at this stage is it past the point of no return? I don't know. I mean, if you if you have ex, I, I remember at the time writing a book in two thousand six saying, you know, uh, if your if your if your debt is more than fifty percent of your balance sheet, you're exposed, and you know people would have thought it was a crazy thing to say move to triple a rated banks buy some gold get out of equities go into bonds all of those things um people people don't do it they wait for the herd to move and um those that do do it will won't regret doing it so um you know the old expression is you've you've never no, nobody ever made um a loss by taking a profit and if you can take your cards off the table quickly enough even if you have to cut your prices um, I would be inclined to do so to try and get your overall debt down to well under, well under 50% of your balance sheet and your and your income to servicing ratio is well under uh, 30%, like well under 30%. So and those that have low income to servicing ratios, in other words, if, the, your, if your monthly repayments as a percentage of your net income is down around, you know, between 10 and 20 percent and your overall loan to uh, property value is, is, is you know, is, is well below 50 percent, then you should be in a position and provided you're, you're not in, a, in an occupation that will be very exposed towards an economic reversal, especially in the service led sector, uh, retail, you know, um, um, hospitality, all those areas are very vulnerable to job losses. Um, but if you're in a strong occupational area, uh, you, you should be able to weather it quite well. If you're not, you really need to use this as a wake-up call. Uh, I can't stress it enough. 
Um, it, but it's a very hard message to emotionally absorb. Mm. And that, what I think you are saying is you can't assume that magically the government will click their fingers and solve the problem. Um, you know, magically the, the Reserve Bank will move the rates and everything will fix itself. That's just not the way that these things play out, is it? No, there's no, there's no, there's no silver bullet. Um, mm. I, I wish there was, but there is not. Mm. And all yeah. of the evidence, from what I can see, is that typically, on average, uh, you know, it takes between six and eight years for a recovery uh, from yep. from 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 a property burst. If you get a, if you get a banking burst with a property burst, then you've got a you've got a significant you've got an extra significant problem, and then you've got a state intervention. I'm not saying it's going to happen. You get state interventions. We had over here, and um, we had to put 64 billion into our banks, which is just a huge amount of money. Just to put that into perspective, we went into the burst with a with a with, with a national debt about 20 20 20 25 percent of our GDP, which was one of the lowest in Europe. We were absolutely, we were the star. We were the, we were the economy everybody wanted to be. And, uh, and, we end, and we ended up at one stage looking as if our debt to GDP was going to be about 123%. We've benefited from a very strong economic recovery because we're so open. So we're now down around maybe 70 or 80. And we also benefited from uh, a change in, in, in bookkeeping when the European uh, Union decided a, a different way of measuring um, GDP. So um, we were in a position then to give um, a value to areas of the economy we couldn't give a value to, including prostitution. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that as a by the by. We, yeah. we benefited enormously <laughs> by the changes to GDP. So suddenly our GDP leapt, but it's actually more book, a bookkeeping thing. We yeah. also, we also, because of what's happening with our next door neighbours. Um, and despite the short-term impact on the Irish economy, we're well positioned to benefit from um, from being the only um, English-speaking um, English-speaking country uh, in, uh, in left in the European Union, uh, sure. and um, and with, with a very well-developed um, FDI sector. So we should do okay. The problem with FDI, of course, is that you become too overly reliant on it, and it actually sucks the uh, human resources and capital out of developing your own indigenous SME sector. And that's an issue that uh, that is yet, yet, yet to be tackled. But, you know, by come the 29th of March, Dublin uh, might be the leading, be the largest English speaking city still left in the European <laughs> Union. There's a thought. Well, well, that's quite a thought. Eddie, look, I really appreciate your time and your, your insights. They have been hugely valuable. And, uh, you know, I think you've underscored for me again the, the echoes that we're seeing down here in Australia and uh, the lessons that clearly can be learnt from, from the, the Irish cycle previously. So thank you very much for your time today. Very it's welcome. been really, really interesting. Can I just leave you with one last comment, Martin, if I could, for, for those that listen to this, is yep. if, there's, if there's one thing people would take away from the Irish message and, and you're in Australia, is look out for one another. I can't stress it enough. Really look out for one another because it's going to, it's going to get rough. And, you know, it, it, because you, you won't have had the experience of it before, it's terribly important that, uh, that, 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 that you don't resort to the blame game and that you actually resort to... Uh, how, you know, throwing our arms around people and looking after them. I can't stress that enough because we've had a lot of misery over here that could be avoided with, with, with a better emotional understanding of what's coming. And, and I think that point about the emotional intelligence, which is what you're talking about, I think is a really, really important message because we often seem to sort of just get rational about this and you know, economic rationalism or what have you, but there's a whole social, economic interface here and actually it's people and the health of people that ultimately really are the most critical outcomes aren't they absolutely and yeah. um 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 i can only say in my case in 2009 2010 i had about four suicide interventions from people i didn't know phone calls mm. coming in please ring mm. my husband please ring my brother i'm very worried about my certain members of the family that's i mean that was a sign of extreme desperation and mm. and a lot a lot of those families are still under the cash of um, of lawyers from vulture funds as, as, as they've been called you know distressed uh, mortgage investors and and, it, and and it's ongoing and it's it's there's a lot of private suffering going on in the background that's avoidable. Mm. Eddie, I think that's a very very important message. Thank you so much for making sure that uh, right. came across. Really appreciate it, and uh, maybe we can catch up again down the track and see whether, in fact, Australia does follow Ireland even further down the road. <laughs> well, we'll see. I hope not. I hope not. Mm. I really do. Uh, I don't think it will 
I don't think that's going to happen, though. I don't think that Australia is going to get out of the jam. I just don't see how it's possible. No, well, I can't, unfortunately, see any way that we can actually avoid going through the spin cycle, unfortunately, based on where we are and where we've come from, uh, yeah. particularly when our politicians are still blind and deliberately uh, avoiding the issue and saying that the economy is wonderful. And, um, in fact, the other point I'll, I'll, I'll say just as we close is that there are many politicians who are looking for any excuse that they can muster so that when things do go wrong, they can say it was somebody else's fault. Yeah. And that, for me, Sounds tells me you yeah. something, ab <laughs> something about the psychology of politics, perhaps. <laughs> Eddie, thank you very much. No, Good to talk Martin, to you. You're very welcome. Thank bye you. Bye. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye. A really, really important message from Eddie there. And I think, personally, it is the social side of this whole issue, which is one that we should be considering very carefully now. Because ahead, I think we're going to be down a very bumpy road. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.